Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Wednesday. Uh, my name is Tony Butler. I'm one of the life sales directors here. And um, I also have Andrew Herrera, who is a regional vice president with North American. And we're going to be talking about um, the IUL uh, arena as far as post um, AG 49B. Um, in my conversations or in our conversations with advisors, um, there are advisors that are aware of this um, rule and there are some that are not. So we wanted to make sure that um, we have that conversation being that this um, was placed in effect as of May 1st. So a couple of things I want to um, just talk about from an insurance agency marketing services uh, standpoint, and then we're going to uh, get into what the webinar is all about. So. One thing I want to point out to all of our advisors, because this is really important and we're having more and more conversations in regards to this, is us being your back office support um, and you understanding that there are things that are available to you via our website, um, as well as from a support standpoint, either from our sales team or our new business team. We want you to uh, work smarter, not harder. So um, that is all encompassing, meaning paperless contracting, um, assisting you with uh, quotes as well as uh, different business building tools and resources uh, available for you. Um, and in saying that, um, our website has a plethora of tutorials um, and guides for you to help you with your business. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is eApps, electronic applications. Um, that is the most um, streamlined process as far as submitting applications and the majority of the carriers that we work with um, are on either one or two platforms. Uh, those two platforms are going to be IGO eApp Solutions, which the majority of our life insurance carriers are on that platform. And then we also have Firelight, uh, both of which can be accessed through our website. Um, in saying that, if you're not registered with Firelight, you can get registered via our website. And as you see here, if you're an annuity agent, uh, the majority of the carriers that we work with on the annuity side of the business is on Firelight. And then we do have a few live carriers that are on Firelight as well. Um, lastly, I wanna point out um, as far as the uh, website is concerned, if you need assistance as far as submitting electronic applications, please reach out to our new, our new business department. Um, they'll be more than happy to walk you through the process as far as getting those applications submitted. Um, as you know, the quicker the application is submitted, the cleaner the application is submitted, um, the faster we can get uh, things going and get things paid. Also, if you're looking to grow your business, I strongly recommend doing a marketing analysis. Uh, we can help you either grow your business, whether it's uh, turnkey agency or digital solutions. And what that means is if you need help as far as logo designs, business cards, um, handouts, newsletters, or you're looking to get into the digital marketing space and you need assistance with the website, um, whether you wanna update your website or you're looking to have assistance on building a website. We can help you with that. I would strongly recommend that you reach out to your sales director, whether it's on the life side or the annuity side. Um, we can do a marketing analysis with you. Um, that'll take about maybe 20, 30 minutes um, where we can kind of talk about your business, what you're doing now, what you're looking to do, and provide some solutions for you to help you grow your business. Life and Annuity Academy. Want to talk about this real quick because this is going to be a nice segue uh, from um, our content that we're going to be discussing today as far as IULs. Because as you well know, our Life and Annuity Academy is a two-day training, which includes um, us partnering with some of our top uh, carriers uh, where we're talking about different sales ideas and strategies. Um, and things that are working in the market, uh, things that are not working in the market, um, different topics on, on the sales side. And right now, we currently have a couple of IUL academies that we're going to be doing. Um, one in July, coincidentally, is going to be a North American uh, Academy. That one's gonna be in Chicago. 
And then we have one that's going to be in August. Um, that's going to be uh, with Allianz, and that's going to be in Minneapolis. Um, being that this is an IUL webinar, and we have those academies coming up, uh, I strongly uh, suggest if you are a IUL producer that we get you registered for that. So I've got a polling question. So if you're interested in doing that, please, please respond to this polling question so we can get additional information out to you. We actually have um, a website that's dedicated to this. I can get you the link to, to where you can register. So I'm gonna leave this up here just for a little bit to give you guys time to uh, respond and then we'll get started. All right, let me go ahead and close this down. All right, Andrew, are you there? I'm here. Okay, give me just a second and then I'm gonna have you share your screen. There you go. Perfect. And Tony, let me know if you can see that. Yes, I can. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate the opportunity to be, um, you know, with all the audience producers uh, this morning, or uh, I don't think it's yet afternoon. Uh, for any of you, but um, as Tony mentioned, you know, what we want to talk about this morning is IUL, specifically accumulation IUL, and the impact uh, to the product uh, with the most recent regulation that we saw with the AG49 update that occurred uh, just a few weeks ago on May 1st. Uh, for those of you that aren't, you know, familiar uh, with, the, with the AG49 guideline that was updated, I'll kind of, you know, go over the, the context and history on how we got here. Uh, for those of you that are, um, you know, you're probably familiar or have seen those changes implemented. If you've run illustrations pre uh, May 1st and post May 1st, there's no doubt you've seen an impact regardless of the carrier of your choice. You know, everyone has been impacted by that. Uh, so, like I said, I'm going to go through some of the history, but, but more, more importantly, I want to highlight, you know, what the opportunity is um, because I believe at the end of the day, it's still a very valuable product that a lot of clients need. Um, and, and it might just, um, if anything, might just change the way we present it. Not necessarily for the worst, too. Um, you know, there, 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 you know, is some positive in here, uh, and hopefully, as I go through this, you'll you'll be able to see that. So again, we'll go through the history here on on how you know we got to the uh, latest uh, regulatory update on AG 49A. So if we go back to the late 90s, and this is pre. Uh, index uh, universal life. So IUL is not even hasn't even arrived in the life insurance scene in the late 90s. Um, and so when we're talking about UL universal life products, um, what you would have seen in the late 90s is current assumption product, right? So a life insurance carrier had a UL product and they were, you know, providing um, a you know cash cash value in the policy based on you know their portfolio returns that they were getting as a carrier. Uh, and that could have been anywhere in the neighborhood, you know, five, six, seven percent, uh, maybe even higher, depending on how carriers' portfolios were doing in the late 90s. But there was really no regulation or framework for how, you know, those products had to be illustrated. And so that's when we see the first illustration regulation arrive on the scene again in 1997, uh, kind of providing carriers some guidelines on how to illustrate these universal life products. Well, if we fast forward, we know that. IUL actually arrives on the scene, you know, somewhere around 2005, uh, in, in around that time period. Well, unfortunately, the guidelines that were provided in 1997 for how to illustrate universal life products uh, didn't have IUL in mind at the time. And so, again, when IUL arrives on the scene in the life insurance space, um, there, there's really no 
guidance or framework on how to illustrate index universal life products. And, and unfortunately, a lot of carriers who had products um, at that, you know, in, in that period, in the early generation of IUL, could illustrate as high as they wanted to. And, and for those of you who were in the insurance space at that time, maybe you even sold IUL in the early days, you probably remember that illustrated rates could be, you know, seven, eight, nine percent. And finally, it wasn't until 2015 that AG49, uh, you know, arrives and says, hey, this is kind of the wild, wild west as it relates to IUL illustrations. We, uh, you know, we need to provide uh, carriers some guidance on how to illustrate IUL. And so really, you know, the regulation at the time basically said, how you, how you illustrate your IUL product needs to be tied to something, right? It just can't be an arbitrary number that you select. Uh, you know, it needs to be based on, you know, look back. Uh, of 20 plus years on returns on an S&P index or whatever, you know, your index uh, default choice is going to be. And, you know, that needs to dictate what the max illustrator rate you can have uh, on on an illustration. Well, that, that's fine. Um, you know, carriers adopted those guidelines again in 2015 and the industry moved forward. But what we saw then was an emergence of multipliers and buy up options on policies. And so a carrier could illustrate, you know, based on the 2015 AG 49 guideline, they could they could illustrate, let's just say, a 6% or a 7%, as long as they, you know, that, that was justified based on the look back. But if they had a multiplier on the product, really what they were showing, depending on how high the multiplier was, was a lot of times you were you were illustrating in the double digits. Um, you know, especially in, in the later years on a policy. And so the regulators were like, that's not what we intended when we rolled out AG49 in 2015. Uh, so we're going to do AG49A. We're going to provide an update in 2020 and essentially saying that you can have a multiplier on your product, but you can no longer illustrate that benefit, right? You can't, you can't illustrate the, the, the buy up options uh, that carriers were, were, were showing. And so again, the regulators thought, okay, we've, you know, we figured out a way to curb the illustration to get carriers in line with what our intent was back in 2015. Um, but as many of you likely know, you know, carriers will always innovate uh, around, you know, a regulation. And so what you saw happen after 2020, and this is more prevalent in the uh, annuity space prior to arriving on the life insurance uh, scene. And those of you who write annuities were probably more familiar with volatility control indices, um, you know, before those of you in the life insurance space were, uh, or, or you probably saw them on annuity products, you know, before you saw them uh, become popular in life insurance products. But again, after the AG 49A update in 2020, a lot of carriers adopted volatility control indices on their life products. Uh, so much so that really became kind of the default. Uh, North American included, you know, we 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 rolled out our Fidelity uh, Volatility Control Index, and the problem then, uh, as we fast forward into uh, really 2022, is when um, you know they started meeting to to try and adopt the AG the latest AG 49 update uh, that went into effect this year, May 1st of this year. But really, where the regulators were coming at is they said, you know what? Um, the benefit of the volatility control index index, we're not sure that it really uh, should should outweigh what you're illustrating on your S and P 500 index. And so they came up with a compl complicated formula that basically said, we know that you're saving money, you're saving on option costs for your volatility control index because obviously it's a less volatile index, so option costs are cheaper. And uh, because of that, you're able to add bonuses and all these other additional things that carriers are doing. They're taking those savings, putting them back into the product in some form or another. And the regulators didn't feel that essentially the uh, volatility control index should outperform or out illustrate the you know gold standard, what, or at least what they believe is the gold standard being the S&P 500 index. And so again, on May 1st, you saw that update go across. Uh, and, and the impact has been big because as I mentioned, most carriers um, over the last several years have been utilizing a volatility control index, and that's primarily been 
uh, the default index of choice for, for the majority of IUL carriers. And again, whatever whoever your IUL carrier uh, of choice is, it's likely that they have a volatility control index. We, of course, pushed back along with a lot of our carrier uh, fear companies as well, you know, when, when we were fighting this regulation saying, you know what, uh, volatility control in, in, indices are beneficial. Um, and in any given year, they can outperform the S&P 500. Last year was a clear point for us North American when the S&P 500, you know, as many of you know, the market was down, you know, 20, 30 percent last year. Well, the S&P 500 would have returned to zero because, you know, that's the floor, zero percent. However, our fidelity index, because it has a 1.65 percent bonus on it, even in a zero year, uh, clients who had allocated money to that index were credited 1.65 percent. You know, and that may sound low, but it beats the alternative of, you know, assets that would have lost 20% or even a zero having a 1.65% credit uh, is a positive story. And again, last year is a testament to the fact that a volatility control index, at least North Americans, could outperform the S&P 500. Of course, that won't happen every single year, but that's not what we were arguing. You know, we, we were basically saying that uh, these volatility control in indices they, they they can work they do work uh they are beneficial um you know uh and uh, again unfortunately that is not what the regulators decided and so s p 500 kind of became the 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 uh the standard by which everything is measured now and and because of that you've you've likely seen a reduction in you know illustrated values and in income values on illustrations uh after may 1st and so Again, like I said, there's a renewed emphasis around the S&P 500. A lot of carriers have switched back to the S&P 500 as that being their default index. Um, but, but really, as you're building a case, you know, as you're working with IMS to illustrate an IUL policy, um, you know, they can certainly, you know, run a carrier default. But you might ask yourself that, uh, you know, do I do I want to diversify? Do I want to do you know 50% of the S&P 500? Do I do I want to do 50% in the volatility control index? Uh, you need to re remember that even though the illustrated values may have come down on the volatility control index, it does not impact what they actually do. Right? Nothing nothing in our product actually changed. We didn't get rid of our 1.65% bonus. We didn't get rid of the participation rate. Um, it's just we can't illustrate. Uh, you know as high as we did prior to May 1st. But but again, the, the structure of the product hasn't changed behind the scenes. There's no impact on the bonus uh, on our volatility control index. And so, um, again, that became effective May 1st. But but as you move forward, especially as you're illustrating IUL, you know, just be mindful that this may not illustrate as high as I would like it to illustrate, but there has been no change to the product, so maybe it's still an index that I want to out, have a client allocate dollars towards. And, and, and as I mentioned, um, the industry as a whole has been using volatility control indices in IUL for the last several years. So this really was something that impacted just about every single carrier that I can think of uh, that's in the IUL space. But the most important question uh, I, I think that we have to ask ourselves uh, in the industry Hey, Andrew. 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 Something's wrong with your sound. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Yep. Yep. You're good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Let me know if. Uh, that uh, happens again. Um, okay. But but uh, uh, I, again, the question we have to ask ourselves is, 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 is this concept, right, is this concept driven or is it illustration driven? Meaning, are we um, promoting this as a piece of paper in front of a client saying, this is absolutely the income you're going to get if you purchase an IUL, or are we telling them about the concept that this is a, you know, a, a tax advantage solution for you, Mr. or Mrs. Client, and, you know, what I'm showing in this piece of paper is just an example of what could happen, but this isn't the end all be all. And I think that is probably, if there, again, if there is a silver lining in all this with the, with the AG49A update that occurred, it's hopefully it will pull us uh, further away from the illustration 
and back to talking about the concept of life insurance, the concept of cash value life insurance and the benefits that, that it provides and not, you know, what we're seeing on a piece of paper. Looking at the competitive landscape here, uh, you can see that, you know, we're still a top five carrier in the IUL space, uh, even after uh, the changes, you know, with this regulation. But as a whole, you can see that income has dropped dramatically across the board for all carriers, income has dropped. Um, and that's by and large, as I mentioned, because everyone has been using volatility control indices. Um, and, and because of that, you know, their illustrations, you know, have changed from prior to May 1st to post May 1st. We're already seeing, you know, uh, what carriers are doing to kind of pivot, right? So some carriers are saying, you know what, uh, we have a VUL product that doesn't fall under this AG49 uh, guideline. So, you know, we're, we're going to maybe shift our focus to that product, the variable side of things. Um, you know, other carriers are adding a loan bonus, uh, as we have already on our products. We have different loan options. Uh, a client can use one, of course, incorporates a bonus. Um, but I think probably the most interesting thing that I'm seeing carriers do is segmenting off uh, a portion of their portfolio. And this has already happened in the industry. I know of uh, one carrier that's already done this, and, and I think more are probably going to follow suit. And the easiest way to think about this is if those of you that are, that are selling uh, annuities, you already know this, that annuities are new money products, meaning that when interest rates are high, as they've been in the last you know 12 to 18 months, annuity products have become really attractive because annuities benefit from current interest rates more so than life insurance does. Life insurance is a portfolio rate product, meaning that um, whatever interest rates are today only moderately impact life insurance products because when, when money is invested, you know, people buy uh, IUL today, we take that premium, we invest that in our portfolio. Well, we're also investing that with years and decades worth of other, you know, premium that we that we've invested. Uh, so we've got different tranches um, that that go back, like I said, years. And so, as, as a total portfolio, interest rates today only have a nominal impact on what that portfolio is yielding versus annuity rates that are immediately impacted by current interest rates. And so, life insurance carriers are saying, you know what? Can we? create a new portfolio today and, and take advantage of the high interest rate environment. And so we can launch a new IUL product with higher rates, almost, almost like, you know, the, the annuity world does. Uh, and so, you know, again, I see, we've seen carriers already do this and they're doing that because they want to build a more competitive product and take advantage of the higher interest rate environment, thus allowing them to, illustrate higher than they would otherwise. The problem with, with that, or potential problem, I should say, is the second you create a new portfolio and launch a new product on that, uh, if interest rates decline, and again, we see this uh, in the annuity space all the time, when interest rates decline, what happens to annuity rates? They become less competitive, almost overnight. And so, the worry is if you launch if you launch a life product on that same chassis, interest rates decline, then will that life insurance product immediately become less competitive again overnight? Um, and the other issue or question about starting a new portfolio is what impact does that have on your existing portfolio? Right? Are you basically sectioning off all those other clients who bought past products of yours? and saying, we're going to kind of push you to the side and maybe even neglect you, and we're just gonna focus on new sales and this new portfolio that we've created. So uh, not saying that, that you know one is the right answer, one is the wrong answer, that's just, I think that's something that carriers are going to need to work through uh, at this time. And like I mentioned, you know, carriers have already, uh, some carriers have already moved in that direction. Um, you know, as far as what we're doing, we're, we're holding steady with our product. It, it still remains competitive. As I've shown you, we're still a top five carrier on paper um, for for IUL. And certainly, you know, we, we think that beyond the paper, the other things that are important in a product, we certainly bring to the table. 
Um, but, but that's, you know, as far as the question of what's next in the industry, you know, how is the IUL industry going to react to this? That's where we're already seeing uh, take place. But going back to our product, specifically in North American, our Builder Plus 3 accumulation IUL, uh, again, we're still competitive. We have, we still have the industry leading bonus, uh, which is 1.65% in the first 10 years, 2.65 thereafter on money allocated to the fidelity index. We still have one of the highest chronic illness, uh, maximums in the industry at 2 million. Most carriers, if you read the fine print, uh, tap out at 1 million on their chronic illness writer. Uh, we're the only carrier that I know of that allows term conversion into an existing IUL. So, of course, you can convert North American term into any permanent product. You can convert into a new IUL, uh, but we're the only carrier that I know of that allows conversion into an existing IUL. We do index credit on beginning value. That means when a client pays their premium, most carriers will take that premium. They will, you know, deduct all, all the charges and upfront costs, you know, on the product, and then they'll use that net amount to credit uh, the index. Uh, we still, of course, take off charges and everything else, but we use the gross amount when uh, indexing, uh, doing index credit to give the client, of course, more bang for their buck. We've got things like protected death benefit, right, which puts the power in the consumer's hand to say, you know, when, when, if they want to turn that on, uh, I've accumulated X amount of cash. I want to uh, section off a portion of that and, and provide a guaranteed death benefit in this product, and then we can start taking income. So uh, again, it's similar to an overloan protection rider, but it gives the client more control. We've got living benefits, which we'll highlight more uh, later on our critical chronic and terminal illness rider, which are included on our Builder Plus IUL. So moving on from there, uh, hopefully that was a, uh, you know, a short recap and history on how we got here and the regulation that we've seen uh, move forward on May 1st of this year. But I do want to highlight the opportunity today, right? It could, like I said at the beginning, I, I still believe that IUL is such a valuable solution for clients, and it's still a story we need to be talking about and promoting to, to customers when, when it makes sense. You know, and, and this is something that I alluded to earlier as well, that, you know, the conversation needs to be not around the illustration, not around the numbers we're seeing on a piece of paper, but rather the concept overall. And there's no other solution out there. There's no other tool in the financial industry that provides a tax-free death benefit, tax-deferred growth, and tax-advantaged income. Simply put, there's no product out there that can do all that. And when you think about the concerns that clients have, especially as a near or in retirement, right, and they, and they worry about the volatility that exists in the marketplace, right? Imagine if you had a client, uh, or maybe you do have clients who are currently retired, right? And they experienced a loss in their accounts that many saw last year with the market being down. Um, you know, clients that are getting older worry about uh, getting sick, you know, because maybe they've had family members who have been impacted by things like Alzheimer's or dementia or have gone to a nursing home, right? And how are they gonna pay for that? Uh, clients who are getting older think about their legacy, right? What What is it they're going to leave to their kids, to their grandkids, their church, their charity? You know, these are all things and concerns that they have. Specific to retirement planning, again, this is a, a very important conversation. And, and many of you are probably familiar with what you're seeing on the screen here because maybe you've seen it before. Maybe you, you Maybe this is something that you talk with your clients about, right? You talk about the different tax buckets that there are. And I, I know some agents who will draw this out on the yellow pad, you know, when they're sitting across the kitchen table you know, from a client and, and they'll say, Mr. Or Mrs. Client, you know, where are, where are all your retirement uh, assets being saved today? The majority of Americans who are saving for retirement are using the qualified retirement plan, right? It's likely a 401k through their employer. And there's certainly nothing wrong with taking advantage of a 401k, especially if that employer offers a match, the, you know, those are free dollars that you do not want to leave on the table. But should all your eggs be in one basket, right? Unfortunately, most people who are taking advantage of a qualified retirement plan, that's the only bucket they're using for retirement. And when you think about that, what are you saying when you're doing that? You're saying, I am okay deferring all my taxes to the future. I'm okay 
to pay my retirement tax bill at some point in the future, whether it be in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you know, whenever I retire, I'm okay paying all my taxes at that point in time versus diversifying and paying some today, right? Taking advantage of these other buckets. Uh, most notable would be the tax advantage bucket with things like uh, a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k or certainly cash value life insurance. And very few people are taking advantage of that. And unfortunately, wherever I travel to in this country, when I ask, you know, clients, do you think taxes are going to go up in the future, regardless of their political position, most clients will agree that they do think taxes are going to go in the future, go up in the future, because they look at where we're at today in a historically low tax rate environment, coupled with the amount of debt that we have in this country. Most clients agree that, yeah, there's no way that we get out of this. There's no way we meet our obligations in the future unless taxes go up. And if you believe that taxes will go up or that they could go up in the future, why would you be okay saying, I, I want to pay all my taxes at that point in time when tax rates will be higher? That makes no sense at all. And I think a lot of clients are going to be very upset with their agents and advisors in the future when they get into retirement and realize that they, that taxes is not something they planned around, and, and yet it's going to impact how well you know they're going to be able to retire. Retirement income gap, right? This is something um, that that we see is continuing to grow every single day in America, especially with high income earners. Being that that. With what they're saving, it will still not be enough to supplement their retirement need. And so they need additional sources of revenue in retirement, additional sources of income in retirement. You can see on the right there the chart, right? If we're told by the industry that, to, that you ought to be saving 15% of your income today, 15% of that should be allocated for retirement purposes. But based on the maximum amount that someone can contribute to their 401k, you can see that someone making $175,000, they can't even hit 15%, right? If they're maxing out their 401k, they can't even get 15% of their income saved for retirement in that vehicle. And you can see as your income, you know, if you have clients whose income is higher than that, the examples here, 250000 half a million dollars, you can see that they're nowhere near the 15% goal that they should be at. And so, again, what additional buckets could they contribute to above and beyond their qualified plan that would help not just help them close that gap that they're going to have, but also be a tax advantage solution in addition to that? This is one of the most uh, probably powerful articles I, I've seen in the last year. This was done uh, in fall uh, of last year. Ernst & Young did a study. And the cool thing about this study they did, one, it was a third party, right? This is not something that a, that a carrier uh, put forward. But Ernst & Young did, some, did this retirement study, and they looked at different ages, right? And they ran a Monte Carlo analysis of over a thousand different scenarios, looking at different uh, inflation rates, different you know retirement uh, return rates. And again, they looked at uh, couples um, in different age groups, right? And, and so this, this study basically said, what is the best outcome? What's the best probability of success for someone in retirement? What sort of financial vehicles would they use, right? And, and I think the common myth or assumption is all of your assets should be, you know, in AUM, right, and invested in the market, and that's going to provide, you know, the best retirement for you. And this study concluded that that was not correct. It also looked at the, you know, what I call the Dave Ramsey approach, which is, yeah, buy term insurance. That's the only life insurance that makes sense. But invest the rest. Buy term and invest the rest, and, and and that will be the best retirement outcome for you. And this study looked at that as well and concluded that was false. What this study found, again, across all these different projections and scenarios, was that the highest probability for success in retirement included assets under management, but also included permanent cash value life insurance, and annuities. So for those of you that sell annuities, um, I think this, this you know, affirms that that, uh, that is a very useful tool as well. 
but permanent cash value life insurance, right? Not a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, are tapping into that as an additional asset that they ought to have, especially for retirement. And the study, when it, when it looked at that, it basically said that if you look at years where the market is down, why would you take money from invested assets when the market is down? So we, again, we look at last year when the market's down 20%. If you were in retirement, that's the only bucket you had. You would have to call your advisor and say, I still need my money to live on in retirement. So let's sell, you know, however many shares uh, to do that. And you would be selling when the market's down. That doesn't make sense at all. You're depleting your portfolio. Instead, if you have permanent cash value life insurance, that would be an ideal year to tap into that asset. And in doing so, you can tap into permanent cash value life insurance, which will not be down 20%, right? Because you've got a floor of zero, at least an IUL. And that allows your investable assets time to return as the market, you know, eventually will likely return in the future. But again, the highest probability for success in retirement includes a portfolio that has cash value life insurance. And I, th I think that was, again, that was neat to see that, um, you know, these products that we talk about as solutions, they really do matter. They really do make an impact. They really can position the client for the best outcome. Looking at, this, at an example here, um, picking on a 50 year old male, right? And, and this male has a million dollars of invested assets, you know, money, in the market with, with his financial advisor. And simply having 3% of that, 3% of the million dollars, uh, you know, moved aside, taken out of that portfolio, so leaving the other 97% invested, taking 3% and allocating that to fund life insurance. Again, he's 50, we're gonna say we're gonna fund this for 15 years, stage 65. He wants to do this to provide a tax, you know, a, a death benefit tax, free death benefit, and of course, to have tax uh, deferred growth and tax advantage income. You can see here, easy math, 3% of million dollars, $30,000 of annual premium, funding the policy, like I said, for 15 years uh, until he decides to retire and then he turns on income on this policy. Uh, this is run, again, very conservatively, especially in light of the new AG49 update. So you're seeing the S&P, 500 index use here. I've dialed down the in, uh, the crediting rate to 5% all the way on the column on the right. I can actually illustrate higher than that. But again, I'm not trying to get a client in this, in this example to buy a piece of paper. I'm trying to get them to see how this concept works and can benefit them, right? It, it, it's, a, it, it's a way to diversify their overall portfolio and to add supplemental income in retirement. And as this plays out, you can see I've drawn income here, uh, let's say to age 85. Um, and, and by the time this is said and done, at least on this illustration, he's put in $450,000 of premium and taken out over 830000 of tax-free income, right? And oh, by the way, if you look all the way on the right, you know, there's still a residual death benefit that would pay out if he dies as well. Again, that doesn't mean this is exactly what's gonna happen, this policy could perform far better than this. Uh, uh, again, I've dialed down the illustrator rate on this, but this just shows you the client an example of what could happen. And, and, and the ideal clients for this sort of planning are those, I would say, typically, you know, between ages 35 to 55. Uh, certainly, if they're a little bit older than 55, this can still be a solution that makes sense as long as they're gonna fund it for enough years and more so, you know, we're seeing people uh, retire later on in life. And certainly, you know, this could still be used for someone in their later 50s or early 60s. Um, this is underwritten life insurance. So, of course, you know, it depends on their health. They need to be insurable. Uh, but definitely high-income earners. As I showed that chart before, those people are going to be, uh, you know, dramatically affected by having a huge retirement gap if they don't do something to cover that need. What I'm showing here now, um, and I think this kind of sums up the story here as I, as I wrap this up, going back to this, this idea that we as an industry ought to be talking about the concept, the solution, and not, you know, the illustration. And if you think about, you know, uh, Mount Everest, 
and many of you, you know, are familiar with Mount Everest or have heard stories or maybe even read books uh, about it. Many people think that, you know, climbing Mount Everest is a lot, you know, is analogous to retirement. And that, you know, when I retire, like I've reached the peak, you know, people think if I can retire at 65, like that's, that's my peak. That's, that's my Mount Everest. I've accumulated X amount of dollars. Um, but, but if you know anything about Mount Everest, you know that getting to the top of the mountain is only half the journey. And the other half of that journey is getting down from the mountain. And in fact, uh, if you know anything about Mount Everest, you probably know this statistic too, that more people die of the descent from, from Mount Everest than the, than climbing up, than the ascent. And the reason for that is it's, it's a lot more difficult. The path down from the mountain is a lot more difficult than the path up. Couple that with the fact that you've got fatigue, right? You've been at this expedition for, for a long period of time now. It's starting to wear, uh, on your body. And, and the, uh, the elevation actually has an impact on your brain as well and your mind. And, and so it, again, it just naturally becomes more dangerous, uh, on the way down. And if you think about that again, as retirement, so many people think that, oh, I just need to get to retirement. I just need to get to that age, to that dollar amount, and everything is going to be okay. And they forget about the way down from the mountain. They forget about, oh my gosh, what if I, what if I get sick in retirement? What if I have a long-term care type expense in retirement? What if taxes go up in retirement? What if inflation impacts for my retirement? What if the market is volatile in retirement? All these things that can have an impact on someone's retirement years. And so wouldn't it be nice to have a solution, a tool, a bucket that can help out with all those things, right? That can help eliminate a lot of the volatility in the market. That if taxes go up, guess what? I got a tax-free bucket. I don't need to worry about that. If I get sick along the way, I've got a solution I can tap into to help offset some of those expenses because my life insurance policy has living benefits. And if I happen to pass away, then I know that a tax-free death benefit will pay out to my heirs, to my beneficiaries. Again, I think that is, is the story that hopefully we are talking about with our clients and our customers. So lastly, you know, I we were remiss not to talk about North American as a carrier and why I hope you consider us, you know, moving forward as you implement some of these solutions with your clients. I know I've focused the majority of this conversation today on our Builder Plus 3 product, right? Our accumulation IUL product, that's certainly a product that was impacted by the AG49 update, but we do have a comprehensive portfolio. We do have other products that we offer at North America. And I really think, you know, uh, one thing that sets us apart from other carriers is we do have breadth of product. There's a lot of carriers out there who are just you know, one-trick ponies. They just have one product, but we've got, you know, a product that can help your clients or whatever, you know, avenue or, or, or wherever age they're at in, in life or period. Maybe they're not, they're not thinking about cash value life insurance. Maybe you work with younger, you know, generations who are just graduating college and are more focused on term insurance today. Well, we have the cheapest term product in the market that has conversion and living benefits. We also have guaranteed products. And our custom guarantee and our protection builder IUL, both are guaranteed death benefit products, and you can dial that guarantee all the way to age 120. So if you have a client who's more legacy oriented and is saying, I want a death benefit guarantee that will pay out when I, you know, die at age 95 or 100 or 105, again, you can dial that guarantee all the way to age 120. We've got our accumulation builder plus three product that I've highlighted, and we have a single premium IUL in our Smart Builder 2 product, which provides high early cash value. Uh, if you have clients, especially older clients who are looking for some safety, some liquidity, some leverage, that Smart Builder 2 product is a great solution for those clients. And of course, the living benefits, CCT, critical, chronic, terminal illness provider. A critical illness, so there's five triggering events for that. The most common are cancer, heart attack, and stroke. Uh, the other ones are kidney failure or organ transplant, but again, the most common are cancer, uh, uh, cancer, heart attack, and stroke. 
uh, for chronic illness. Uh, in order to qualify for that, it's uh, if a client can't do two activities of daily living, it does not have to be permanent. A lot of carriers, again, if you look at their fine print on their chronic illness riders, one, they cap out likely at a million dollars, ours is two million, and a lot of carriers will say your client, you know, can't do two activities of daily living and it needs to be permanent. With us, it does not, as long as it's over 90 days. So if the doctor, you know, were to say, Andrew, uh, based on this accident, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to feed yourself and bathe yourself and that might last six to nine months. I expect you to recover. I could tap into the chronic illness rider at that point. So again, it does not have to be permanent with North American. Terminal illness rider, pretty simple. Um, that's uh, two years or less of life expectancy. Uh, and, and then you can accelerate a portion of that benefit for that. You know, recently we had a case, unfortunately, um, with a gentleman who's in his 40s and uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer and reached out to uh, North American claim area to accelerate under the terminal illness writer. Uh, his doctors, unfortunately, with the type of brain cancer he has, have, uh, his doctors have given him less than a year to live. Um, and, and so even though that is an unfortunate uh, scenario, uh, to, to, he, he was happy uh, at least to be able to utilize his life insurance policy and he can now tap into that and is using those, you know, that, that money that we've accelerated him uh, to help pay for medical expenses and other things that, that uh, him and his family are incurring right now. So again, th these are, um, you, you never like to see someone go through one of these critical chronic or terminal illness events, but if they have that happen to them, um, the peace of mind knowing that, hey, at least from a financial perspective, I've got something additional here that I can utilize. Um, that is a huge benefit uh, for people in need. Ease of doing business. We know this is really important, right? We know it's important uh, to, to, to make this process as painless as possible. If you think about um, what Tony said at the beginning of the call when he was talking about the, the support that IMS provides, and, and, and IMS does a fantastic job uh, of working with their agents and their producers to provide a lot of that back office support and to be an advocate for you. And similarly, when we partner with IMS and with you, we want to provide ease of doing business as well and make, and make the process easy. So everything from eApp uh, to online part two, that, that is the health and lifestyle questions that, that a client answers. They can do that online. Again, uh, I've seen clients do that, you know, on their iPad. It just takes a few minutes to knock that out. We have accelerated underwriting, which, which some clients will be approved via that way. Uh, we allow for e-signature through DocuSign, and then we can do e-delivery, right? If a client's approved through accelerated underwriting, which usually happens within a day, from the e-application to e-delivery, that whole process can be less than a week. I mean, that's how quickly it can go. For accelerated underwriting. That is available for ages 18 to 50, up to $2 million, ages 51 to 60, up to $1 million. All products that I showed earlier in that slide are available for accelerated underwriting, and that is offered standard uh, and better. Right now, we are very competitive, and we have been, uh, with, with not just our underwriting offers, but in turnaround times. And so over the last 12 months, 90% of the cases we've had have been standard or better. 90% of the offers we've made have been standard or better, and nearly half of the business, so nearly 50%, has been preferred and super preferred. I talked about accelerated underwriting, right, just a minute ago. 57% approval rate, meaning that clients who, who meet that age and face amount for accelerated underwriting, we're seeing 57% of cases approved through that, and even if they don't qualify, qualify for accelerated underwriting, and they need to go through full underwriting, right, where we have to, uh, you know, do blood, urine, having an exam done, even traditional underwriting. We're averaging 31 days, uh, which is industry leading. There's not a lot of carriers who can top these numbers that you're seeing here on this screen. We've got a host of additional resources. I know that I've uh, very, you know, very briefly gone through our product portfolio, but certainly if you have questions on not just North America's products, but maybe you want to find out more on sales solutions, or, or concepts uh, outside the ones that we've talked about on this webinar, uh, there's a whole library of information available to you. No login is required. Uh, you can reach out to Tony 
or anyone at IMS on the life team, they can direct you to that website. Um, you know, we'd be happy to share, you know, those additional resources with you. Uh, and again, all that is available to you without a login. And lastly, you know, I, again, I know that there's a lot of carriers that you have access through uh, via IMS, but one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, at North American is the fact that we are a private company, which means that many of you, you know, who've been in the life insurance space or just, you know, the insurance industry space in general, you've seen a lot of changes happen with carriers over the last decade or so, right? Carriers that are, you know, bought by private equity or owned by, you know, foreign governments, uh, carriers go out of business, publicly traded carriers have certainly made decisions uh, that, that affect, you know, that, that are driven to the shareholder, right? And not really driven to the agent or the consumer. Uh, and the fact that we're a private company means we don't have to answer to Wall Street. We make decisions, um, you know, for the long term. We make investments for the long term. We've been in business over 100, you know, plus years. We want to be in business well into the future. We're domiciled here in, in Iowa, where I reside. Um, you know, we're, we're a strong uh, financial company, uh, AM Best, uh, S&P Global, and Fitch have all given us A-plus rating, and we've had that A-plus rating for decades, right? So we, we've held on to that and sustained it. We've got strong, stable leadership, um, and, and that's important because at the end of the day, we know that, that you all uh, are, are, are in the promise business, right? And, and your, your clients expect those promises, uh, a carrier to deliver on those promises, and you want to have a strong, stable carrier who's backing those promises at the end of the day. So. Uh, again, I really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in uh, this morning. Thank you, Tony and the team at IMS for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you. So uh, with that, I don't know if there's any questions, um, but I certainly am available to uh, hang around for a couple minutes if anyone has any follow-up questions. Yeah, it looks like there are some follow-up questions here. Um, one of the questions um, was, will we be able to get a copy of this slide deck a recording of this presentation as far as the recording is concerned absolutely i think the slide deck that they were referencing was that retirement planning um, deck that you had so i guess my question to you um andrew is any part of that powerpoint would be available uh, yeah absolutely i can share that with you tony and then you could uh distribute accordingly okay all right Let's see what else we have. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry, I'm trying to get to the next question. Looks like we've got a few here. So that one's done. All right. Oh, that's it. Okay. Actually, there's a compliment. Um, I've experienced great and very fair underwriting with North American. Thank you. Awesome. It's great to hear. Okay. All right. Then someone would like a copy and I'll make sure that I get that out to you um, real quick um, while you guys if you're thinking about other questions a uh, couple of uh, polling questions I want to just throw up there real quick um, before we end our webinar um, obviously we just talked about this but if you want more information um, on the topic today definitely respond to this so make sure to get this out to you timely want to make sure that we get the information out to those that are, are looking for it and get it out in a timely fashion. So I'm going to leave this up for a little bit um, while we go through that. And then for those of you that have any additional questions, please go ahead and type that in the question box and uh, we can take some time to answer that for you. Okay. I'll close that out. And then the filing Final polling question is, if you're not appointed with North American and you would like to get appointed, which we would love for you to do, uh, please respond to this polling question. Make sure that we get the uh, appointment request submitted for you. So I'll leave that up here for a little bit. 
And as you see on the screen here, don't forget uh, about our IUL academies that we have in July and August. Uh, the quicker that we can get back to you on your interest, uh, the quicker we can uh, hopefully get you registered um, because we do have limited seating on both. Okay. All right. Well, lastly, um, our seaside sanctuary trip that we have that's coming up, um, as you see here, qualification periods, um, it's 18 month qualification period and 4.5 million points. Um, the time to qualify is from July 1st of 2022 all the way up until December 31st of this year. Um, if you have questions on where you're at on this, uh, definitely reach out to the sales team. We can provide you with more information. I know that we do have a few people that have already qualified for this trip. So, And again, any questions that you have, um, here's the life sales team. Um, myself, Trina Murray, and Beth Rickliffs. Um, there are our emails there, or you can reach out to us at the 800-255-5055 and just ask to speak to someone in the life sales department. And for um, this content, as well as other content that we have available, uh, follow or like us either on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, that's pretty much that all that I have. Uh, Andrew, any final words? No, it's just uh, thanks again for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, like I said, I'll follow up with you, Tony, send you uh, the information, and uh, you can distribute that to the group accordingly. Awesome. Andrew, I want to thank you for taking time out for this. I know that you've been really busy, especially uh, since May 1st. It's been kind of crazy for you. So you taking the time out to go over this, I think is definitely beneficial um, to all of the advisors. So thanks again for everybody for attending. Um, we will be reaching out with that additional information for those of you that were looking for additional information. And you guys have a great rest of your week and a great holiday weekend. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.